uh, the the uh, uh, the major presentation I think most people uh, feel is uh, Mr. Wilbur's reading his own verse this evening. He certainly is a major American poet, but uh, uh, some who know of Mr. Wilbur uh, uh, as a poet may not know that he's an important translator too of uh, the, the, the French neoclassical drama of Moliere and Racine. Uh, uh, many of us know this because in English 251 we do have his translation of Tartuffe. Uh, and, and this, in fact, is the uh, way in which uh, uh, we conceived of asking, asking Mr. Wilbur to come. We were in a world literature meeting. Uh, I was asking uh, just uh, what we might do for a program, and uh, Dr. Valencia uh, said, well, why not ask Mr. Wilbur to come? And I said, well, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I tried it, and it worked. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the, the, this session is really uh, the, the thing that uh, might come first uh, in, in that priority. Uh, the, the, some of you may not be familiar with Moliere's Tartuffe. Uh, you might have a sample here, uh, for starters, of, of just what kind of, uh, of, of verse, what kind of language we have. Uh, you may remember in, in Tartuffe, if you have read it, that Orgon, taken in by the vile old hypocrite, has ordered his daughter Marianne to marry Tartuffe. Marianne, half-minded to acquiesce in her father's orders because her true love, Valère, has not been more aggressive in his objections, is nevertheless desperate and asks Doreen, the wise servant, for advice. Now, Marianne says, uh, 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 advise me and I'll do whatever you say. Doreen, rather scornfully, replies, ah, no, a dutiful daughter must obey her father even if he weds her to an ape. You've a bright future. Why struggle to escape? Tartuffe will take you back where his family lives, to a small town, a swarm with relatives, uncles and cousins whom you'll be charmed to meet. You'll be received at once by the elite, calling upon the bailiff's wife, no less, even perhaps upon the mayoress, who will sit you down in the best kitchen chair. Then, once a year, you'll dance at the village fair to the drone of bagpipes, two of them, in fact, and see a puppet show or an animal act. And uh, uh, she's going to go on, but Mary Ann says, Oh, you turn my blood to ice. Stop torturing me and give me your advice. So that's the kind of, of, uh, of comic poetry we have in Moliere's Tartuffe. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilbur has expressed the, uh, the, the wish to respond to questions, and I might uh, start with one, and uh, uh, we'll, and he will take it from there, and then uh, I'll uh, uh, recognize uh, anyone uh, in the audience who has the next question. Uh, as someone who has sometimes. Uh, tried his hand at translating in, in a very uh, schoolboyish way. Uh, I, I wonder just how close, Mr. Wilbur, that this uh, uh, translation or uh, uh, your translations in general are uh, to the original. In other words, uh, how uh, good a guide would they be uh, to uh, 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 reading uh, this French for oneself? That's, that's evidence there in case I need it. Um, well, that's, that's a big question. And uh, my, my answer to it is probably uh, rather simplistic. Um, what I aim at when I translate is putting whatever abilities I have as a poet uh, fully at the service of the original and pursuing 
the illusion that I'm being absolutely faithful to the original and not putting in any clever additional notions of my own. Now you can't translate even from a language rather close to ours and a culture rather close to ours like the French, you can't translate word for word because the languages are too different. What you come out with if you try to do it word by word uh, is a kind of jabber that is neither English nor, nor French. Fidelity consists in, in translating thought by thought. But our languages are close enough, our cultures are close enough, even with the three centuries gap between us and uh, Moliere, uh, so that it's possible to <clears throat> take Moliere's Alexandrines, his 12 syllable lines, and put their content rather comfortably into our fundamental meter, the five foot pentameter line. All of my translations from my six translations from French classical drama all turn out to have the same number of lines as the original. And uh, this was not uh, achieved in any Procrustean fashion. I wasn't aiming rigidly to come out with the same number of lines. It's just that the content of uh, a French couplet is very likely to accommodate itself to the English couplet. Well, I'm claiming thought by thought fidelity, and um, so I guess I'm saying that at the very least what I've done is a good trot or pony or whatever it's called nowadays, that you could, that you could put my translation on your left hand and the original on your right hand and find that they corresponded quite closely and use them as a means of reading the French uh, if you didn't know the French uh, very well. I hope that what I've done is always both a trot and something more. Um, I hope that I've always arrived at something which sounds like comic drama in English. And I'm encouraged to think that I've succeeded much of the time simply because uh, so many good actors have proven that um, these rhymed comedies of Moliere will, after all, work with American audiences. Back in 1952, when I first started messing around with the idea of translating Moliere into English, I think I felt that I was producing uh, fundamentally a reading version, a reading in an armchair version for um, people of some culture and, and imagination who, who just didn't happen to know French. I was making Moliere a little easier to, to come by for such, for such readers. Then I began to throw a scene or two of my translation of the misanthrope as it proceeded into poetry readings that I was giving, taking the parts of the various characters as well as I could, for I'm no actor. And I found that people were amused by them, uh, that they seemed to play. And uh, when translated to the stage in 1955 and 1956, uh, the misanthrope did turn out to work for our audiences with very little adjustment. Prior to that time, there really hadn't been rhymed verse comedy on the American stage. We didn't even have a big tradition of, of pantomime as they do in, in England. Uh, we didn't have a lot to prepare our audiences for stomaching uh, rhyme uh, on, on the American stage. It seems to me that after um, a few moments of initial shock, our first audiences uh, adjusted it at once and treated the rhymes as uh, transparent and in some cases as uh, comic in themselves. Uh, rhymed tragedy, of course, is another matter. I've 
in recent years translated Racine's Andromaque and, and his Phaedra. And um, directors, uh, though they've been very interested, uh, have not yet quite dared to try to put a tragic rhymed verse uh, on the American stage and see if it would go down with our audiences. I think it probably will if we can just find absolutely perfect casts of, of, uh, of actors. The, with, with Moliere, actually, you don't need absolute perfection in the actors. It'll play pretty well if people can just read the lines. Well, I don't know whether I've answered Mr. Wilkerson's question, but uh, that's a bit of initial floundering. And uh, I'd be grateful for any other questions that may be on your minds. Yes? You seem to be suggesting that we are living in an unpoetic age, at least in so far as tragedy is concerned. I wonder if you would comment. I think what I meant most about, about uh, rhymed tragic verse on the American stage was not so much that, uh, not so much that, excuse me, am I, am I not being heard? Is this getting across all right? All right. It's not so much that, the, that, that tragedy or poetry is tough to take for our audiences as that the presentation of those things in meter and rhyme um, may be a bit of a shock for us. Um, Rhyme is easier to swallow in, in comedy than it is in, uh, in tragedy. I'm sure there's an explanation for that, but I don't think I'm going to be able to be glib about it. It's, it's just a fact that one has to confront. Of course, it's true that there are moments in uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, for example, in which the characters uh, speak in rhyme. There's a moment in which I believe someone speaks a whole sonnet as if it were dialogue. Um, but on the whole, it's hard to adjust to. And I think in the, in the, in the, in the uh, violent and strange world of Racine, it would be particularly, um, uh, to particularly demanding for us. I don't think our audiences are unpoetic at all. Uh, uh, it seems to me that, that, that there's been a very great development in the, in the past uh, 30 years or so in America in regional theater. That's where the real life is in American theater nowadays. And that it's, it's created a very large audience, which is not necessarily stuffily high tone, but is, is, ready to, is ready to take on Samuel Beckett and all sorts of difficult and challenging things. Yes. What sort of considerations and decisions do you have to make when it comes to the timeliness of language, certain phrases or, or slang or, or whatever? Or do you just um, go for the timeless, or do you just risk it and hope your decision is going to be born out? That's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And of course, it's an endless concern of the translator. Uh, I guess my answer is that I go for the timeless, as you say. Um, which indeed is hard to do. Um, uh, a, a lot of uh, language that might be considered timeless is so considered because it's dead. It uh, doesn't have any element of invention uh, in it or no conspicuous invention. Um, yet it's there, it can be found. Um, in translating from Moliere, I have uh, avoided old hat language that uh, <coughs> belonged to a comparable stage of English theater. I've avoided the egad kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I've tried to be uh, uh, breezy and uh, simple, uh, adjusting myself, of course, to the manners of, of each of the, of the characters, uh, and at the same time not be too slangy because, you know, I think one of our big delusions about language is that slang is lively. Mostly it's not. It's uh, pretty dull stuff. Uh, uh, year after year, 
slang changes, doesn't it? And we get uninteresting little reports on the latest slang words in, in the New York Times Magazine section. And mostly these words are just ways of saying good or bad or in or out. Um, when I was at Amherst College, if you, if you thought somebody was socially unacceptable, you described him as wet. We all said wet uh, about people we didn't like. Well, what's brilliant about that? There's nothing lively about it. It's just the in word of the moment. And most slang, I'm afraid, is of that character, and so dates very rapidly. The, uh, the wonderful scholar and light verse writer, uh, Morris Bishop, did some translations from uh, Moliere. And uh, everybody had enormous hopes for them, and I think they're a little disappointing. And the reason is that he uses too much of what now appears to be period slang, 23 skidoo sort of stuff, you know? That was a wow of a thing to say in the 1920s, but it's utterly lacking in life at the moment. There's, there's, one, there's one line in uh, my translation of Tartuffe, which I think probably is, is uh, culpably slangy. I have Cléant say, it looks to me as if you're out on a limb. That sort of stands out from the rest of the language of the play, and uh, I've sort of made notes to myself to go back and change that sometime when I've got an excess of energy. Well, go for the timeless is my, is my answer, and of course that's a groping prog pro uh, process. You do it line by line. You say, has this got life, and at the same time, is this, does this avoid the, the, the dated or the pointlessly jazzy? <coughs> any, other, any other questions come to mind, sir? Maybe a, <coughs> maybe a question to attend that one. And extended a little bit. I think, among other things, some of your critics have called you uh, not not intending to be a pejorative at all, clever, mm -hmm. in the sense of the 17th century metaphysics. With a, a mindset like that, which makes for clever poetry, are you ever tempted in your translations to inject a, a term, a clever term, from your own thoughts in an effort to catch? the milieu uh, of the original. Something wasn't in the original, which sounds like Wilbur rather than like Moliere. Well, all I can say, of course I'm tempted, because I like to make my kind of joke whenever possible. But uh, I, I really do try to resist that temptation. Uh, in writing my own poems is one thing. I let myself go, and I'm perfectly happy to be myself and am unashamed about it. Uh, but in, in translation, my ideal really is to be anonymous and uh, servile, slavish, to um, put myself at the service of the original and just let it come through me as through some kind of transparency. I, I know that I can't quite do that, but that's what I try. And that's why I I attempt to be vigilant about what you describe. Uh, there are some marvelous poets like Robert Lowell who in their translations, or rather imitations, that was his own term for it, uh, quite freely inject uh, their own kind of imagination and uh, their, their own kind of special effects. I try not to do that. Now, there, the main criticism that's been uh, leveled at, uh, at my translations of Moliere is that um, I have sometimes taken the darkness out of a play like Tartuffe. And, um, well, I don't think I have. I'm accused as a poet of being sunny and positive, too much too cheerful. And uh, so I suppose people readily look in any job of translation I do to see whether I've adulterated the, the, the text, uh, inf infused it with too much of, of my own uh, 
high spirits or whatever it is. Um, but no, I really do, I really do respect this uh, rather patient work I've done enough to say that I have been faithful thought by thought to the original and I've been as faithful as I could possibly be to the tone of the original, which of course is the, is the crucial thing. That's the thing above all in translation. It's not so much what does somebody say, but how does he say it? In what tone does he say it? I hope that I've been as faithful as I think I've been to thought and to tone. But there are built-in um, infidelities in translating from uh, French into English. Um, my, I say French in such a dreadful way that I'm not going to recite any lines of French verse to you, but, but uh, you know that it's a, it's a language much less emphatic than ours, uh, much more uh, wave-like and syllabic in its movement, so that rhymes at the end of the line in French don't go bang the way they do in English. Um, well, if you're proposing to be faithful to Moliere's form, or to the form of any uh, metrical and rhyming French poet, uh, you're going to have to find uh, rhymes of a similar character to those in the, in the original, and uh, faithfully use them. And that will mean that your lines will go crack at the end in a way in which the lines of the original don't. Well, if what you're translating is a comedy, it's going to sound as if <coughs> you were trying for a laugh oftener than the original does. The lines helplessly sound a little more like gag lines uh, than, the, than the lines of the original will. I'm sorry about that, but uh, there's no there's, there's really no getting around it. If, if you think, as I do, that the preservation of the form of the original is absolutely essential, then you've got to put up with this little infidelity uh, that's caused by the emphatic character of American uh, verse rhythms. Which of your translations is most difficult and, and why? I think that uh, translating from Racine, and uh, Andromache was the first one of his that I tried, uh, was infinitely harder than translating from Moliere for various reasons. Uh, for one reason, uh, I absolutely love Moliere, and uh, I feel as if, I, I feel that he's a marvelously humane person, and that, uh, and that I would like to be like him, that it's a pleasure to speak for him. Um, I don't feel that about Racine. Uh, I, I find it very difficult to adjust to the nastiness of Jansenist theology uh, and, the, uh, and the boring idea of fate, which he uses again and again in his plays. I, I have to stomach those things in order to uh, uh, translate him. But then to speak of the positive qualities of Racine, uh, I discovered as I began to work on him that he isn't, as I had ignorantly thought, he isn't so much glorious band music. Indeed, what's, what's so impressive about him is his simplicity. He uses just about the smallest vocabulary that was ever used by a great writer. Very simple words. And re he repeats his simple words over and over. Um, and, uh, of course, this entails not being afraid of an obvious rhyme. All of this prevent, presents a great challenge to the, to the translator. To, it's the, the hardest thing in the world is to translate a powerful simplicity. It's uh, much easier to translate playful and relaxed uh, language, or Baroque language, for that matter. Uh, so, that's what was hard, getting going on uh, Andromache. And I could think of some other reasons, too, why I found uh, Racine uh, daunting. Yes? Why did you begin translating the first book? Did you think it was a challenge, or were you just 
just interested in it? I think the question is, why did I begin translating in the first place? Um, I think there are a couple of reasons for it. Um, after, uh, I, I've, I should say in the first place that I've never been a good linguist. Uh, I was a fairly idle student of, uh, of French uh, when I was in school, always, it seems to me, taking the beginner's class. Um, and, um, well, I did do five years of Latin, and I took a lot of pleasure in Latin. So I had, a, I had acquired in my lazy way a certain grounding in the Romance languages, but that's all I had. And I've never become a finished linguist in any language. Um, but after World War II, during which I had served <clears throat> uh, in the 36th Texas Infantry Division, along with a lot of wonderful soldiers who, on the whole, didn't have any French at all, uh, I had found myself uh, serving as a company interpreter and began to pick up a little everyday French and to believe in the reality of the French language, as I'd never done when I was in school. Coming home from that war, I had a kind of ignorant but slightly uh, whetted feeling about French. <clears throat> and I went to Harvard Graduate School on the GI Bill. And there I met two wonderful people uh, for whom the first language was French. One was Pierre Schneider, who's now an art critic in France. The other was André du Boucher, who's a, 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 an outstanding French poet. Uh, he was just graduate stu school uh, scholar at uh, Harvard then. And uh, André began interesting me in this or that uh, French text. And, <clears throat> encouraging me to be adequate to these texts. Uh, and after a while, he, when, he, when he had learned that I was a poet, uh, he began to say, you ought to try translating that. And so I cut my teeth under the whip of my friend André. He was, he was already writing poems, and, and we used to sit around sometimes in the same room, he translating me and I translating him. Um, that was wonderful. He made me sound like Baudelaire. Uh, but all, all this was a stimulus toward doing something about French and having fun with, with French literature, <clears throat> which, of course, I was, I was approaching in a fully amateur way, not as a scholar. And then, uh, back in the late 40s, early 50s, there was an outfit in Cambridge called the Poets' Theatre which began to put on uh, poetic plays. Uh, this was stimulated partly by the, f the successes of T.S. Eliot's Cocktail Party on Broadway and of um, The Ladies Not for Burning. Uh, these are two, two undeniably poetic plays which had made it on the Broadway stage and about which people were excited. That led, <clears throat> that led many uh, largely young people in the Cambridge, Massachusetts of those days to think of writing plays in verse and um, putting on existing plays in verse, like some of the great verse plays of uh, William Butler Yeats. That gave me the notion that, uh, that I ought to do something of the sort, though I couldn't detect in myself any capacities for drama. Uh, and I applied to the Guggenheim Foundation. I said, if you'll give me some money, I'll go somewhere and write a poetic play. And they did, and I went to the New Mexican desert and sat around in an adobe house there trying to write a play in verse. It turned out that I had no ability to break myself up into characters. I think this is probably very common among lyric poets. A uh, lyric poet, as Yeats said, only has to know his own blind, stupefied heart. He doesn't have to know much about the world, much about other people. And uh, I just couldn't create characters. Um, and so I turned in despair from my efforts to write uh, plays of my own, remembered that I had seen a wonderful production of Moliere's Misanthrope in Paris in 1948, and thought, well, I might learn something about poetic drama if I translate one of its great achievements, if I translate Moliere's 
misanthrope. And, and in the process, maybe I can claim for our own language a masterpiece of world literature. So that's how I, that's how I started, sitting, sitting out there in, in New Mexico, translating Moliere, because I was frustrated with my inability to write a play of my own. We're VSC students working to bring you better local programming in the area of sports, arts, and information. Thanks for joining us. We're VSC TV. Some other questions? Yes. Right to hear you say, says Moliere, it's easier to perform, or let's say comedy, generally speaking, is easier to perform than tragedy. I've always believed and still do, and I've seen Moliere as a comedy, uh, that it is one of the hardest things to put on it with Moliere because you can kill it if you don't have that stylized acting style, if you don't sweep your head even correctly. The whole thing becomes fast. But I think oh, yes. tragedy you can get away with all kinds of things, because people like to cry anyway. Well, I, I probably don't really disagree with you here. And, uh, the, um, I think what I was trying to say was that if, if, perfect, if perfectly untrained people, people with no acting ability, sit around and read the parts of a Moliere comedy in a living room, uh, of course a lot gets lost, but something gets across, something happens. Some of the laughs can be laughed at. It seems to me that, that if, a, if a tragedy is so treated by amateurs, it is simply butchered. It never... Yes. <laughs> well, is, uh, is there an, another comment? Yes, please. Uh, difficult to... For the stage directions, when, I, when we read it, we noticed that you um, translated and wrote in the stage directions. Yes, there, in print editions of uh, Tartuffe, as I remember, there are different stage directions, uh, but uh, I, th I thought it important to, uh, to translate uh, as, as many of them as seemed to me uh, likely to be useful in in any production. Uh, certain stage directions would be suitable only to certain interpretations or treatments of the play. But I, trans I tried to translate all the directions which would help the reader and the director of a play to uh, uh, visualize the action. Um, I've, I've enormously enjoyed translating plays and I think that I've become more sensitive to the art of the theater through doing it. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not Moliere, and I and and when I read him, when I try to translate him, he makes me aware of <clears throat> how far I come short of being a man of the theater. Um, well, here's the supreme example uh, of my failure of imagination. Um, or, uh, at the at the. <clears throat> At the beginning of every scene in a Moliere play, you have a list of the characters who are on stage. And um, for a real theater person, uh, it will always be apparent, I think, why each of those persons is on stage. Though some of them won't have anything to say. Uh, why is so-and-so on stage if she doesn't have anything to say? Uh, you, you think about it and you think about it, after a while, you realize that she's there because, in her presence, so-and-so who does talk is going to have to modulate his utterances in a certain way, or because it's going to affect the relationship of two figures there who are also related to her in a certain electric way. But I don't see those things as fast as a real theater person would do. And so, um, though I don't like the page of a translation to be cluttered with directions, I put in as many as seem uh, fundamentally useful for the sake of people like me. How have your translations uh, affected your own Translation, any job of translation you, you do does affect your own original 
work. Um, I think probably not in a conscious way, but, uh, well, as everybody knows, when you're writing a poem, you're not writing a message to anybody. You don't visualize an ideal reader. You don't think of a room full of people you'd like to please. You're just trying to make a good object there uh, in which you will uh, discover and distill what it is that you think and feel. Um, once you've made the object, then you hasten to type it out uh, neatly on a piece of paper and send it out in hopes that it will be published and that people will find it emotionally and, and intellectually useful. Uh, but the act of writing a poem is, has nothing to do directly, immediately, with audience. Um, of course, when you're writing for the theater, you are thinking of manipulating an audience. As you, as you are when you do something else I've done, I've, I've written Broadway lyrics. You have to ask yourself when you're writing a lyric for a Broadway show, however highbrow it may be, you have to ask yourself, what is that man from Scarsdale in the fifth row going to understand? Uh, what will amuse him? What does he know? You have to be terribly aware of the, of the audience. I, th I think that... Uh, Working a lot in the theater, or working a lot for theater, uh, uh, inclines you in your writing of poetry, though you're still not focusing on the audience, uh, inclines you in your writing of poetry to uh, adopt strategies, uh, which, uh, when you come to read your poems aloud, for example, will have a certain dramatic uh, value. The, in translating Moliere, thought for thought, uh, you often find that there are about four different ways in which you could faithfully translate a line. You could say it truly in four different ways. Well, now, which one shall you choose? You'll choose the one which tends toward timelessness, as was suggested. Um, but also, if you've had a certain experience in the theater, you'll choose the way of saying it which will allow an actor, uh, an effective emphasis, and you'll choose the way that will be most easy for an, for an actor to articulate, to get off his tongue. Um, when I was first writing poems, I, I thought of them as uh, on-the-page objects quite strictly. And uh, in my first book, there are there are lines which it's extremely hard to pronounce, horrible clots of consonants, you know. And, uh, and I know that my experience as a species of theater person has led me to always to favor the more easily articulated. And, uh, and I think, without being terribly conscious of it, to, to favor what is interesting in the way of sound development, because an actor likes that, or an audience listening to an actor likes to hear an interesting progression of sounds. Ezra Pound, in his uh, ABC of Reading, points this out about um, uh, the 17th century English poets, that they were, they were all very close to the poem as a song, therefore they were much more aware of vowels uh, and, and of sounds generally than the contemporary poet is. But theater has certainly given me that kind of awareness. Do you, do you think that maybe I'll just read you a scene? Would that be, I, I just, I would like to read you a scene from one of Moliere's least known plays. Um, and just uh, not to shut off discussion, but uh, just to give us a, a little interlude here. This is from uh, The Learned Ladies, uh, one of Moliere's last plays. Um, I wish I could read Act Three, because it's the funniest third act he ever wrote, but it's got too many characters in it. I couldn't possibly intelligibly handle it all by myself. 
but I will read uh, Act Two, Scene Seven. Um, in this play, now, of course, the, the 17th century French father was really the head of the house, with no, no, no question about it. And in certain of Moliere's plays, the, the uh, condition of the father is, uh, is uh, uh, crucial in explaining the, the atmosphere and the sequence of events which occur. Obviously, that's true in Tartuffe. Orgon is off his nut, and uh, therefore his, all of the natural relationships within his family are jarred and, and jangled. Chrysal in, in uh, The Learned Ladies is uh, another kind of man. Uh, he's a soft, comfort-loving, quarrel-avoiding man. He just can't stand quarrels. Um, and uh, so what he's done has been to abdicate his authority. Um, and his battle axe wife, Philamant, has uh, quickly filled the power vacuum. And uh, she has transformed the household into a kind of Latin school or salon uh, in, in which um, uh, ri ridiculous literary poseurs like a man named Trisotin and another named Vadius make their uh, pretentious appearances. Um, the, the, uh, the ladies of the title are Philamant, Chrysal's wife, Armand, his eldest daughter, uh, and Belize, uh, his uh, crazy uh, sister. Now, Moliere would not make fun of the desire for learning in women. It's not at all his position. The thing about the women of this play is that their, their supposed aspiration for learning is badly motivated. Why does Philomant want to have a salon? She wants to have a salon because uh, in holding a salon in, 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 her, in the midst of her upper bourgeois life, she's imitating her aristocratic betters. And that's a poor motive. It doesn't have anything to, with, to do with learning. And um, what else? Well, at one point, Philomant says, uh, we're going to have a learned academy for women here to show men that women can have learned academies. Now, showing men is an ignoble motive, too. Um, and at another point, one of these ladies says, and after we've learned a great deal, we're going to make discoveries, and that will make us famous. And the desire to be famous is a crummy desire, too. So that, and so that, so that we don't really have to uh, respect the, uh, these learned ladies in the play. They, they are badly motivated on all counts, and it's all right for Moliere to make fun of them. Okay, well now what's happened at the beginning of this scene is that Philomat has fired one of her servants for making a grammatical error. And uh, so Chrysal comes on stage and says to Philomat and to his sister Belize, well, you've had your way and she is gone but I don't think much of the way you've carried on. The girl is good at what she does, and you've dismissed her for a trifle. I don't approve. Philemant, would you have me keep her in my service here to give incessant anguish to my ear by constant barbarisms and the breach of every law of reason and good speech, patching the mangled discourse which she utters with coarse expressions from the city's gutters? Belize says, it's true. Her talk can drive one out of one's wits. Each day she tears dear Vaugelas to bits, and the least failings of this pet of yours are vile cacophonies and non sequiturs. Chrysal, who cares if she offends some grammar book so long as she doesn't offend us as a cook? If she makes a tasty salad, it seems to me her subjects and her verbs need not agree. Let all her talk be barbarous if she'll not burn up my beef or oversalt the pot. It's food, not language, that I'm nourished by. Vaugelas can't teach you how to bake a pie. Malherbe, Balzac, for all their learned rules, might in a kitchen have been utter fools. 
feel I'm not. I'm stunned by what you've said and shocked at seeing how you who claim the rank of human being rather than rise on spiritual wings give all your care to base material things. This rag, the body, does it matter so? Should its desires detain us here below? Should you not soar aloft and scorn to heed it? Crisal, my body is myself and I aim to feed it. It's a rag perhaps, but one of which I'm fond. Belize, brother, twixt flesh and spirit there's a bond. Yet as the best minds of the age have stated, the claims of flesh must be subordinated and it must be our chief delight and care to feast the soul on philosophic fare. Crisal, I don't know what your soul's been eating of late, but it's not a balanced diet at any rate. You show no womanly solicitude for Philemon, womanly, that word is old and crude. It reeks, in fact, of its antiquity. Belize, it sounds old fashioned and absurd to me. Crisal, See here, I can't contain myself. I mean drop the mask for once and vent my spleen. The whole world thinks you mad, and I am through. Philemat, how's that, sir? Crisal to Bailey's, sister, I am addressing you. The least mistake in speech you can't forgive, but how mistakenly you choose to live. I'm sick of those eternal books you've got. In my opinion, you should burn the lot, save for that Plutarch where I press my collars and leave the studious life to clerks and scholars. And do throw out, if I may be emphatic, that great, long, frightful spyglass in the attic and all these other gadgets, and do it soon. Stop trying to see what's happening in the moon and look what's happening in your household here where everything is upside down and queer. For a hundred reasons, it's neither meet nor right that a woman study and be erudite to teach her children manners, overlook the household, train the servants and the cook, and keep a thrifty budget. These should be her only study and philosophy. Our fathers had a saying which made good sense. A woman's polished her intelligence enough, they said, if she can pass the test of telling a pair of breeches from a vest. Their wives read nothing, yet their lives were good. Domestic lore was all they understood and all their books were needle and thread with which they made their daughters' trousseaus stitch by stitch. But women scorn such modest arts of late. They want to scribble and to cogitate. No mystery is too deep for them to plumb. Is there a stranger house in Christendom than mine where women are as mad as hatters and everything is known except what matters? They know how Mars, the Moon, and Venus turn, and Saturn, too, that's none of my concern. And what with all this vain and far-fetched learning, they don't know if my roast of beef is burning. My servants, who now aspire to culture, too, do anything but what they're paid to do. Thinking is all this household thinks about, and reasoning has driven, and reasoning has driven reason out. One spoils a source while reading the dictionary. One mumbles verses when I ask for sherry. Because they ape the follies they've observed in you, I keep six servants and am not served. Just one poor wench remained who hadn't caught the prevalent disease of lofty thought. And now, since Vosilas might find her lacking in grammar, you've blown up and sent her packing. Sister, I'm speaking to you, as I said before. These goings on I censure and deplore. I'm tired of visits from these pedants versed in Latin, and that ass Trisotin's the worst. He's flattered you in many a wretched sonnet. There's a great swarm of queer bees in his bonnet. Each time he speaks, one wonders what he's said. I think myself that he's crazy in the head. Philemant, dear God, what brutishness of speech and mind. <laughs> Belize, could particles more grossly be combined? or atoms form an aggregate more crass? And can we be of the same blood? Alas, I hate myself because we too are kin and leave this scene in horror and chagrin. Well, that's, of course, a very brief explosion by uh, Crisal, after which he subsides into a ridiculous passivity. <laughs> well, now, I don't know how long we're to go on here. Uh, have we done it? Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Right. Thank you. Thank you.
please return this evening. Uh, we'd like to have you back. Uh, this is a good audience, uh, and we'd like to have you twice. Uh, don't forget the questionnaires, if you please.